Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Learning from Leaders series. Today, we have the privilege to welcome Rick Goings, the former chairman and CEO of Tupperware Brands. And we also have the author of Before I Was a CEO, a long-term contributor to EU Business School, um, Mr. Peter Van Am. Peter, the floor is all yours now. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Luc, uh, to be back for our second uh, um, Leaders Conference. And I'm very happy to be joined. I'm in Geneva, of course, as are you, but I'm very happy to be joined by Rick Goings, who I think is in Florida. Isn't that right, uh, Rick? No, actually, I'm on a farm in Charlottesville, Virginia. Ah, even better, even better. Yeah. Rick, you're, uh, you're now in, um, in a farm. We were actually supposed to meet uh, a couple of days ago in Munich. And of course, that didn't happen. No. <laughs> um, you were very enthusiastic to joining us uh, for this uh, learn, Learning from Leaders conference in, in Munich live. But of course, the COVID crisis happened and that changed all of our plans. Um, I want to talk to you today about your career and about your life and career lessons. But before we jump into that, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about the current crisis, if that's okay. Yes. Because, um, you know, Rick, you know, for many people, they've never experienced something like this. They've, many people have never experienced anything like a lockdown, anything like a threat to lives and livelihoods. Um, and this is a shock that uh, we've not experienced before. I think, though, you know, you've, you've had a long career and uh, a global career. And you told me that with Tupperware, you've actually experienced something that's more or less um, comparable in terms of the impact, the economic impact and the impact on lives and livelihoods uh, at some point in your career. I think you said it was in 2004 in Indonesia when, when the uh, tsunami hit there. Could you tell us a little bit more about, you know, what you think we can learn from the experience that you had there and, and what actually happened then? Yeah, happy to, and good to be with you always, Peter. But uh, we've never had anything like this that was so widespread. As a matter of fact, in conversation with one of my sons yesterday, I was I would encouraged him to go back and uh, look at a series on World War I because it was perhaps the only time something was happening everywhere in the world. Uh, mostly we have things happen in one place and then you can go to another place. Uh, but this has happened everywhere and it's required adjustment. But in our conversation, I do believe that we always have to be ready for the unexpected. The, uh, in, in Indonesia, in Bandarachi, when the tsunami hit, leaders have to be ready to, what do you do then? And that isn't the first time to start thinking about it. You start to have, you have to have contingency plans all, always. Uh, and I think the most important opportunity when there's a crisis is to show what the values of a company are. And in Bandarache, we said what matters is we've got to take care of our 100,000 sales force in Indonesia. And the first thing we started to do was food, clothing, and shelter, get things. And we had distribution to leverage the resources we had. And I must tell you, they never forgot it, that we were there. And we were there first. And when there was graft and corruption with regard to distribution of things, they knew that wouldn't happen with us. So yeah. you have these opportunities to do that. And it's, it's good for the soul of the people in the company and for to validate what are the values of the company? Yeah, you can say that now, of course, because you, you came through that uh, crisis and, and on the other side in a good way. But many companies right now are scrambling. I mean, they're losing money and, uh, and it's not that easy. They may have the right values, but they simply don't have money. I mean, like, to what extent do you actually have the ability to do what's right according to your ethics if you know, you're in a, in, a, in, a, in a cash crunch? Well, I think you always have to. <laughs> Doing what's right is not an economic decision. It's a value decision. And I think it always starts with you do what's right. And you find a way through it. It is interesting. Uh, uh, I would go uh, every other year or so. I'd spend a couple of days teaching at uh, Dartmouth at their Tuck School of, of Management. And I'd relate to that is to students who are watching this. My friend there who teaches strategy, Rich Diavini, he makes it required reading. You know, I have a copy here. Klaus, uh, 
uh, Carl von Clausewitz, uh, Napoleonic Wars. Why does he make this required reading of uh, MBA students? He said because of the 85% of all battle strategies change once the first shot has been fired. And so a great learning is, so what do you do? What do you do? And I think this is going to be an opportunity, yes, challenging, but for some companies to figure out how do you pivot at this time? And they may find out there are new ways to do it. Yeah. Um, now, if, if you were leading a company today, and, and of course, you've led Tupperware for over 20 years, uh, if you were in the situation today, and, and, and Tupperware where is, is, is one of those companies that's facing a crisis, um, what do you think the kinds of decisions uh, would be that, that you would be taking right now? Well, it's been three and a half years. I mean, the stock was $70 a share when I turned over the helm, and I think it was $2 yesterday. They've had three different CEOs, so there's a whole side conversation, and maybe I'll help you with the book on succession, because <laughs> there's something to learn there. But I think this gets back to the point of you start, and I've had the wonderful opportunity to run turnarounds of what do I have to work with here uh, during this. During this crisis, I had a, a, a wonderful conversation with a former associate of mine who's based, based in Germany. And uh, one of the things we talked about is he was up 30%, their company in the first quarter, large company. Why? They pivoted all of a sudden, they would do presentations in home to people. All of a sudden, they shifted. Within two weeks, they created video presentations to do it via Zoom so that they would invite people to a Zoom meeting. Like I'm sitting here looking at a, at a screen now of nine people. Well, I've been on some this week of 50 people. Yeah. You sit there and look for where's the seed of an opportunity in that. And I do believe this is going to change education for the future, because when you look at student debt around the world, 66000 a year for the better schools in the U.S., trust me, and it's 2000 a year yeah. uh, online, there's going to need to be some change happening. So it's uh, going to be here. changing a lot of businesses, right? Um, but well, what... it's going to change things. And I, we're, if people think we're going back to the same uh, world that we left wrong, yeah. there's going to be things different. Um, but but what I hear you say also, and that's quite relevant, because I always think, you know, if you're a direct selling company like Tupperware, you know, they've, they, their bread and butter is to do presentations in homes, social gatherings uh, of people getting close together. And of course, you can't do that. So with my limited imagination, I was thinking, well, I guess that's it. You're out of business. But what you're suggesting with the example that you gave is, well, if you're actually creative, if you reimagine your business and you think of what it's really about, you can come up with new business models that can work immediately. That's the example that you gave of, the, of your friend who organized yeah. uh, virtual uh, gatherings. Think about how the external environment has changed right now. So we're, the, we're all of the people are basically staying home now. And what you notice is people are looking for social stimulation. My goodness, last week, Susan, my wife and I, we had four different cocktail receptions via Zoom that we attended. Uh, and the people ask, okay, can, can we get together with you in two days? People are bored. It, there's an opening for social stimulation because I know it wasn't a chance to be with me. They'd rather be with student or Susan, but social stimulation. So you start to say, hmm, what is the edutainment value that I could bring in a selling situation? Yeah. So you start to look for what can I mine? There's always, as they would say, there's always a, oh, a silver canary lining. in the cage. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that, uh, of course, uh, because, uh, you know, I, I have to say I had the same thing with my wife, uh, who you may know is also from Venezuela. Yeah. Uh, they've been organizing a lot of social uh, meetings. And uh, this weekend, we're going to be participating to a bingo, an online bingo. 
Um, and apparently that's now one of the most hottest activities and it's just a business that started a month ago and they're sort of one of the one of the most successful ones so it's it, it, it what i take away from that is that it's always possible to turn things around it's always possible to reimagine your business and it's always uh, uh, possible to see the opportunity uh, in a crisis but on the other hand uh, you did say and you started out by saying that um, that when a crisis hit and your people were in danger uh, in, in, as was the case in Indonesia 2004, that your first priority then was not to reimagine your business, but to take care of your people. And I think that's a very important um, a lesson to remember as well, to keep always that, uh, uh, to stand that test of leadership. Rick, I want to I wanna talk to you more about, of course, uh, and we all want to talk to you more about what's happening today, um, but we're also hoping to learn from your career. And I already see that uh, some of the students are asking you questions, or want to ask you questions later, on about uh, your career and especially the early stages of your career. So if that's okay, I wanna, I wanna shift now a little bit and ask you about um, uh, when you were young. And I remember you told me this story for, for, for my book uh, before I was CEO. Um, and I was really struck by how it all started because you were not the textbook sort of successful uh, person when you were, let's say the age of the students uh, that the students are today. Right. Um, when you were 17 years old, I think uh, your life wasn't uh, the outlook of your life wasn't all that great, was it? No, actually, n neither of my uh, second generation European, neither of my parents went to university. Um, physically, I was the second shortest kid in my high school graduating class. I had an eye that turned in uh, and so I didn't have great self-esteem. By the way, I'm six one now. So obviously, Sorry. when I was in the Navy, yeah, things things changed, and all of a sudden, I could get an eye operation. But the, uh, so, but that all influenced my 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 self-esteem. Didn't have the money to go to college. I started during the summer, right after high school, trying to sell encyclopedias. And during I wonder if the people still months, know what that is, uh, encyclopedias. You were going, yeah, with, with books, yeah. but door I want to, to door. tell you what's so funny about me becoming the CEO of the most prestigious direct selling company in the world. In the three months of me doing that, I never sold one set. I, <laughs> this is not a Harvard term, I sucked. I was terrible at it. But it was at one of those presentations, I met a nice guy and he told me, he said he had just gotten out of the Navy and that was a turning point for him. And I followed that path. So, uh, so to get this straight, I mean, like when you were 17, 18 years old, um, you were basically, you didn't look good, you didn't feel good, um, you didn't have a lot of money, it didn't look like you were gonna go to college and you tried to make a living by selling door to door books, encyclopedia, uh, in three months of doing that, you were not successful once. And no. then you met somebody uh, uh, who told you, hey, I think you can turn your life around and I recommend that you go to the, to the Navy. Is that what happened? Yeah, that's what happened. It's interesting. Uh, I, I, uh, I went and signed up, enlisted. Uh, I took a battery of tests. I did well on the test. And for some reason in training, they made me the platoon leader. Uh, so all of a sudden I've got a hundred guys reporting to me and my voice hadn't gotten deep yet, but they listened to me and I found out, hmm, you have some kind of a skill here with regard to providing leadership guidance and direction for people. During my time in the Navy, Vietnam era, what was amazing, I was a navigator always in the bridge of the ship. And almost all the time I was there with the, with the, with the skipper, the captain, and the, uh, and the other senior officers, I made a decision at that time, uh, how I wanted to be, how I wanted to act, how I wanted to navigate myself through life. And uh, I had a plan by the time I got out. And the government had come out with what they called the GI Bill, so they were going to pay for me to go to school. Yeah. So, so basically, it was, just, you, it was magic. I mean, this was what yeah. was it? it was the 1960s, I suppose. Um, yeah, yeah, in the mid 60s. Yeah. In in the 60s, and and uh, rather than being all flower power, you were somewhere on a ship uh, in Asia, 
um, close to a war situation probably in, in Vietnam. So, so you were learning a lot of leadership lessons. You were, you were uh, part of a, of a platoon. Of course, it, it wasn't like your life was uh, all uh, roses and champagne. Uh, it was a tough, tough road. But then you were in the Navy for a couple of years and you set this GI Bill for people that are not from the U.S. Basically, it's a, it's a, it's a law, it's a system in the U.S. that allows you, once you've done Army service or Navy service, to be um, to get an opportunity to go to college to go and study, and that's what you did then when you were twenty one or twenty two years old. Yeah, twenty two. I had to stay in for six years, so I was active at sea for a couple of years, and the rest, you know, I would attend meetings. But uh, and then I worked full time in real prestigious men's clothing stores. So by the way, I had become six six one then. I learned how to dress. I was around you know, uh, the senior officers. And the, so it's interesting. You, you, why I, I encourage uh, people to get a lot of experience, get experience around people and pay attention to how they act, what they say. I mean, young as a caddy uh, carrying golf bags at a private club, that was my first time around people who had money. And I watched the way they talked. And I, I watched, uh, I said, this is, I want to mirror that behavior. Yeah, I want that, and so it, it influenced my value system. So you went to you went to college. You did formal learning, but at the very same time, and this is also the per, the period, by the way, or the, the the stage of life that many of the students that are attending are in, um, 21, 22 years old. At that very same time, you were working in as a service, uh, basically in in shops. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the Stockton warehouse, and, and you said I learned a service mentality there. I learned a lot of uh, social skills. So you recommend that. Um, but that's not how the story ends, is it? Because I think that when you were in your senior year in college, uh, there must have been something uh, uh, about you that you said, I, I, I want to do something else. And, and what, what is it that you did next? Well, I had uh, got the idea about uh, people die in home fires. And most guy did research and found out they died between 10 o'clock at night and 6 in the morning. And there were devices out there uh, that could wake them up because most people, by the time they wake up, it's superheated air. They take one breath, dead. Uh, why, why do you well, hold on? I, why do you how do you get such an idea when you're in college to say like, oh, let me think about what happens when there's a fire? I had a friend that was in law school that came in with this idea, but I I had the better idea how to create dynamics and build a company off it, and so. I would recruit college students and they wear a badge that said fire safety crusade. And, uh, and they'd go out and I'd show them how to make part-time money. Uh, wow. making these uh, college students could make back then a hundred dollars a week, which was, which was a lot, which led to me making the decision. I had to quit school. I just didn't have time. Right. I'm not sure if you would recommend that because, you know, you said afterwards you kept on uh, taking classes, even if you were not enrolled and, and, and you've, you have a lifelong passion for learning. But, but let me ask you first. So you were a full-time student when you started um, the yeah. company. Uh, so it, it tells you something about that entrepreneurial spirit that you have and the fact that you probably didn't, didn't wait. Uh, you know, you said, okay, I'm, I got an idea. I'm young. I'm, I've got energy and let's get started. Right. Um, and so you made the decision then to, to run this company. It was, was rather successful, I understand, right? For, for a number yeah. of years. Um, but then at some point, you know, you're probably now in your early thirties, uh, you've had a very successful run, probably made quite some, some good money, but then something went wrong, didn't it? Yeah. The federal government legislated that all homes had to have fire alarms in them. So mass merchandisers went into selling them and it became a commodity and there was no profit margin in it any, anymore. What we were selling for $50, now you could buy for 10 and get a $5 rebate. And so, so all your whole sudden, business model. Uh, hey, by the way, Peter, the second great lesson I learned at that time, don't, when you make money, put it away. Don't spend it. You don't need a Ferrari uh, at that time. I had a you buy one? school professor teach me a great lesson. He said, Rick, the only money you're ever really worth 
is the money you have if you don't work. And from the time I was 40, I kept my lifestyle at a certain way, and I kept building this pile over here of passive income so that I was making income by a, at a point in time, I was making more off my passive income than I was being a public company CEO, which was highly uh, compensation at that time. Yeah. And I guess there's a lesson in there, both for, for students uh, about sort of saving for a rainy day. But when I see what's going on with companies right now, I suppose there's also a lesson in uh, for, for many uh, companies that have perhaps had a short term perspective and uh, gave all their money to, to shareholders and perhaps didn't save for a rainy day. Um, we'll, we'll get back to that, but, um, I want to, I want to close this loop because we were on a very big high in your career. Um, but because of the government decision, basically your business model from one day to the next was uh, destroyed. And so that led you to, to having to end the company, basically to liquidate the company or to sell the company, right? Well, actually I sold it. Yeah. I sold it, but not for much. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you were still very entrepreneurial and then you had your next big idea. And that next big idea, I think was uh, to, to start a weight loss company or a, or a fitness club company. Was it, was that, what was that about? Fortunate life centers. I thought this was going to be brilliant. Uh, we, uh, uh, we basically opened a weight loss center. People would come in, they would, uh, we would give them recommended meals, they'd weigh in, we knew it was a big problem, particularly in this country, and I franchised it. Uh, and I knew I must have been brilliant because we sold 250 franchises with only one in Charlottesville, Virginia. They came in and looked at our model. Well, let me tell you what I learned then. Weight loss is entirely a first quarter business. Uh, that means that people basically, they have a, a New Year's resolution, they say oh, oh, lose it. weight, and then oh, they don't the look same, back. By the way, sign up at a fitness center and watch January, February, March, you're in there and it's crowded. Great, go there in April, fewer people. Go there in June, empty. Okay. Yeah. You make me feel really centers. bad now, Rick, because I got a, a subscription to the gym and I didn't. Uh, but okay, I have an excuse that it's closed now because of the lockdown. Oh, uh, yeah. You, well, if they <laughs> gave you the excuse. Uh, but so we ended up, we closed most of them the second year. And I liquidated my holding on that. And I actually had to sit here in my 30s and say, what are you going to do now? And... Uh, Avon Cosmetics came after me and I went to New York and people would say, well, why did you do that? I said, well, let's see. Now I remember I needed a job. Right. <laughs> and, and I figured, you know, I always dreamed of what would it be like being in the big leagues in New York? And I actually, as I went there, Peter, I thought everybody would be smarter than me. You know, they were Harvard, Yale, Cornell, and I found out everybody was just like me, but most of them had only been in functional roles their whole career in marketing or sales or, 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 or finance. I was a general manager. So when Avon looked at me, it was like going up to the surface uh, to find a mutant who knew how to be a general manager who was in his mid thirties. So it yeah. was magic for me. There's a lesson in there, isn't there, which is, which is to say that maybe when you focus on being a specialist, when you focus on doing one particular thing in the first years of your career, you might go fast and, and, and might go up uh, in the beginning of your career. But then when you're in your 30s or so, at some point you hit the ceiling because you don't have the, the, the breadth of, of experience that you would have had if you had a more adventurous or a more exploratory career, right? Yeah, that's what actually, what, how I always worked with our leadership in my years of running the company was that everybody starts with a functional area. But if I start to notice in their late 20s, or early 30s, they have general management, uh, you know, skills. Uh, they have leadership. They're able to work with others and collaborate. We move them out of that comfort area and we move them into a general management track. However, if they want to stay in finance, I said, fine. What your track looks like is you could become the CFO. Yeah. But 
But we used to say with finance, we, we would often have finance people who had great hearts and we'd get them into general management. <laughs> and they became, they became some of the best general managers uh, all over the world. That you can imagine. And, and I guess that yeah. that's sort of a testament because it's a question that one of the students is asking, uh, Abla Alawi uh, Kobi, he's, he's, he's saying, you know, do you believe that diversification of skills is the key to success? And, and from what you're saying, it sounds like, like that is important, right? Yeah, skills and experience. I've always said, say yes. Hey, for the first thing about life, life should be an adventure, okay? When you sit back there and you think about the things that happen when somebody's in their 80s, adventure is what matters. Say yes to different experiences and say yes to different assignments. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you, when I, when I, when I went to Europe, the best job I ever had was I was a general director of on Deutschland. I loved it. I lived in Bogenhausen in Munich. It was the best job I ever had. It was only a $150 million company, which sounds like a lot, but it's not when you're used to running multi-billion multi dollar companies. Dollar. It was fabulous. Yeah. I still have a reunion with, with that team every couple of years. Uh, and now you do Munich. it on Zoom. Uh, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I have to say, I just came back from, from living in New York for the last seven or eight years. And for many people, I think, uh, going to live in a big city like that, New York or London or maybe Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, may sound like uh, a dream. Um, and, and you were there too. You went to work for Avon in New York. Yet uh, afterwards, you, as you just said, you, met, you moved to Munich and then you moved to, to Asia. Um, why, why, when you're in the Big Apple, when you're in the city of cities, why, why move away from, from New York? The diversity of it. I mean, I think, I mean, I like New York. I've lived there three different times and Susan and I often, we go to, go to New York. I have to go to board meetings and things there. Four days, get me out of there. Uh, I love the diversity of, of, of Europe. I loved living in Hong Kong. Uh, and when somebody looks at my, where my friends are, we're every passport in the world. I mean, and you know, it, it, it is interesting. Uh, uh, the guy who really wrote, uh, uh, wasn't Fiddler on the Roof, uh, Zorba the Greek, Nikos Constanza said, do not seek friends, seek brother in arms. And that's what I've got with women and men all over the world we're all different nationalities, uh, but we have, we built this thing together yeah. when I was there. I never had a direct report one time in my life ever quit and go somewhere else. Um, we, were, we were together. And, and you really did build a, a number of teams uh, around the world. I mean, you, you mentioned the German team. I suppose you'll be having a Zoom reunion. I, I wonder how the, uh, the Oktoberfest uh, will be going on Zoom. Uh, you also lived in, in Hong Kong, uh, and I suppose you, you learned uh, quite a bit about uh, Chinese culture and, and Asian culture. Um, but then in the end, you were almost basically on track to become the CEO of Avon, a very big company. And, and you were even the favorite, at, at least it seemed so, of the, of the, of the, of the CEO. Um, so you were almost there, and then it didn't work out. What, what went wrong? It got derailed. I'll tell you what happened. We had, uh, I got pulled back from being a group president in Asia Pacific to headquarters. A new CEO was installed who was with the company who I knew. And uh, what was kind of weird is we were both of Austrian Czech descent. And I said, oh, this is made in heaven. Uh, and, but there were two takeover attempts. And it was decided that he would focus on takeover defense. I would focus on building the company. Well, that lasted about three years and the company did well. We made it through all that. We weren't taken over, but there became issues with regard to, well, we'd walk down the hall and people would say hi to me and not say hi to him because they hadn't seen him. He had been with the lawyers. All of a sudden there was an issue of arguing and I said, Jim, would you rather I not be here? Jim was a CEO. And I asked him that on a Friday. And he said, hmm, uh, 
Can I tell you on Monday? Well, I knew what the answer would be if you had to think about it. So, uh, you know what? We reconnected. Uh, he's often said Avon would have been a different company had we done that kind of succession because I had 25 years of success at Tupperware. Um, but uh, sometimes it doesn't work out for you. And you know what? You don't spend your time licking wounds. You get on with it. Yeah. Uh, what did I learn? By the way, many of those relationships, oh, relationships all throughout Europe and China. I have become very good friends with senior people in the Chinese government because I had pressed hard for permanent favored nation status for their membership in the World Trade Organization. Uh, because I saw, hey, m m people may think, uh, you know, well, these Chinese communists, like, uh, you know, they're trying to grow from a kind of a feudal society eh, where everybody was poor. They're trying to move it forward. And all you have to do to figure out does that system work? Compare China today to India yeah. today, and you'll and find you know. out. Yeah. But so, Rick, the, yeah, the, 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 the lesson there, I think, because, uh, you know, you were almost the CEO of Avon, and then uh, by, you know, a coincidence or one event, it didn't happen. Uh, you immediately went on to talk about, you know, some of the great experiences that you've had in, in China and, and, and the rest of Asia which sort of already tells us that you didn't uh, uh, continue to think about that, right? So you, you really sort of take life as, you know, whatever is on my path is, what, what, what the interesting, um, is what's interesting at the moment. And you shouldn't put your happiness in the future. You shouldn't say, I want to become CEO. That's the goal in life. Uh, you rather get a lot of satisfaction from all the different experiences that you gather, right? No, yeah, I, you know, I'm very much, uh, if you went around my place here, you would see some Buddhist statues. I've done transcendental meditation twice a day since I was 28 years old. I believe very much in mindfulness and being in the presence. And so I have never had this attitude, I must be at that next level. I always had, I told you, the best job I ever had was General Director Avon uh, Deutschland. I mean, yeah. but each job, you live in the present. I, I was having this conversation, Peter, with somebody who they let go at Tupperware yesterday. And I, what I said to her, her is I said, Nikki, don't worry about, you've got to find the next right thing. Think of life more as bridges, bridges. And don't go to something that it hurts your resume or CV, or they pay you, the, you know, not what you're worth, but I look for a bridge. Yeah. And that's an adventure. And that's the Steve Jobs attitude about try to connect the dots. Yeah. And of course, that's, the, um, uh, that's, that's really what we should remember, isn't it? That uh, uh, you have to, uh, and you said that earlier, you have to make sure that you save for a rainy day because that gives you the, the luxury then when something happens unexpectedly that you can really think through what your next step should be and how you make that bridge. Um, yeah. We're going to turn to questions from students in just a minute. But I, I wanted just to close the loop because after that Avon experience and the years that you spent there, um, you went to Tupperware, of course, and you joined them in 1992 as a president. Uh, and then it's almost like there's a, it looks like there's a straight line between 1992 and 2016. Uh, very quickly in 96, you became the CEO and, uh, and, then, and then chairman also. And you were that for many, many years. Uh, could you tell us just a little bit uh, of what, you, uh, what made you be successful? there and what uh what uh, yeah. what happened there and and i should yeah, say by the way Rick, um I, I i i i hear that there's maybe a little bit of an issue with the audio so uh if if you can maybe check the um, connection on the earphones uh, very quickly i think that should be fine yeah let's go on how about now perfect can we hear okay yeah right. yeah so i actually i had the same job at avon from the day i started it was a division of premark I was on the Premark board, so we just called it different things, but my job never really changed. Uh, the whole story of turning Avon w around was understanding what do you have to work with? And that's if you're, you guys are ever on consulting projects or working within companies in the future, you got to sit there and say, what gives you competitive advantage? And what I found out 
was what gave the company competitive advantage. Firstly, is they provided an incredible earning opportunity for women, number one. And number two, uh, it had a brand name that people recognized as quality. And so what we had to do was uh, come up with differentiated products. So I moved the company away from basic food storage products to high tech products out there. It's interesting. I'm going to step out of camera one second. Uh, <laughs> this, this is an example. This is for grilling steaks in a microwave. It's stainless steel. And people would say, wait, 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 you can't put metal in a microwave? Yes, you can. This sells for $250 in Europe. It's heavy. It converts microwave energy into thermal energy. So what I did was, I got people to sit there and start to look at research development. What could we do? And then what could I give her so that she could share it with others and build a business of her own uh, doing it? Not just selling herself, but also building the sales organization. And so I expanded it uh, around the world. And yeah. as I left, we had 3.2 3 million women. And, and, and as I see you sitting there with, um, uh, with the product, uh, it almost makes me want to go to a Tupperware night with, uh, on Zoom with Rick Goings rather than the bingo night with my wife on, uh, on Saturday. Um, hey, Rick. Peter, Peter, I was last week, I have a brain surgeon friend of mine. I'm teaching him on Zoom how to grill, make a grilled cheese sandwich in his <laughs> microwave oven. And I said, Look at these strange times. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Um, I want to make sure we get to a couple of the questions from the students. Yeah. So maybe I should call on uh, Mohit. Mohit Paul is a student at EU in Munich, as a matter of fact. Uh, he's originally from uh, Delhi, India, and lived uh, all over India, also in, in South India and Kerala. I'm just going to ask, uh, Mohit, could you, uh, could you tell us uh, what your question is for uh, Rick? Thank you so much for the opportunity, Mr. Goings. Uh, nice to have you here. Uh, I'm a student uh, in Munich campus at EU Business School, uh, and I'm studying international business management uh, with finance as my minors. And my question to you is, what essential skills do you think uh, these students need uh, uh, post COVID-19, which will increase the chances of a desired job uh, in the coming uh, days or months? Thank you. Okay. Mohit, thank, thank you, you. And, and an important question, and by the way, I used to live a block away from the Frieden's Angel there in Bogenhausen. I love Munich and you have good taste because you picked a great school. Uh, at any rate, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me address that. Uh, I do believe this relates to one of the things I talked about earlier when I talked about von Clausewitz on war, that you start to learn to be flexible and to be nimble because what you have to look for is because what this COVID-19 is doing right now is where people had a business model that worked, all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore. And you have to be able to, within that, say, what do I have to work with here that could restore some kind of competitive advantage to it? So that's why I, I would go back to the thing about the, the vision, not this so much to look at how things are, but how things are going to be here in the future. What trends do we think now are gonna now change because of this? this there's gonna be a tail uh, on, on this that, I mean, I think with regard to, unless there is a vaccine fairly quickly, you start to see the areas that we think the largest uh, the impact is going to be on crowd gatherings. And then you start to sit there and think, well, what does this mean for concerts? What does this mean for, for you know, all of the uh, sports events? My goodness, what, what's that, uh, what is that going to mean for soccer in Europe? You start to look and say, this is likely what's going to change. And then you find that in the skill set within that, how can I change that? You know, clearly somebody can say, well, IT will help. Uh, uh, but I think one of the things that's going to emerge right now is communication skills are going to become more important. It's become interesting. 
Uh, I had uh, uh, on cocktails last night, former head of the Secret Service, who's a dear friend of mine. He's always protected the presidents. And I was sitting there saying, I said, I can think of about seven or eight US presidents that could have done a better job of communication than we're seeing right now. Communication skills are going to be incredible in the future. I think what you're going to see is a change in trends with regard to how business meetings are conducted. Uh, not going to six board meetings a year, traveling across the country. Why don't we just have two board meetings face to face and do the other four there? Yeah. I said, hmm, I think that's going to be a permanent change. Start to look to those. Which is, that's why I go right back to this thing about try to have multifunctional skills and experience and just say, hmm, what's going on here? And where can I, where can I find some, something in this? Very well. But important question. And, and it is an important question. It prompts other students, by the way, on the chat to ask uh, questions as well. It, it raises all kinds of questions as, and I think you just addressed this, as Michelle Thompson asks, she says, you know, do you think that remote work, for example, uh, will be the new normal in our careers? And it seems like you're saying, well, maybe not 100%, but it certainly will be a part of our life or virtual work will be a part of our life more than it was in the past, right? I think, yes, because what there was in the past, there was a resistance in, in companies and a resistance by some workers to, to do remote. And therefore, we had the question is, oh, what matters, family or work? Uh, and what we're finding out now is incredible levels of productivity that are coming out. You know, yeah. Some of the countries that where I've spent so much time traveling, my goodness, uh, you would know this from India or, oh, Indonesia. Our average Indonesian associate traveled an hour and a half each way uh, to work three hours wasted per day uh, uh, in it. The average commute to New York City right now is an hour and 15 minutes. And the problem is most of the entry level people, sometimes they live two hours away. Uh, yeah, away. So I was lucky. I was only 15 so minutes away by bike, but that's a, that's a luxury, I suppose. I also want to ask yeah. you one uh, further follow-up question. And then move to uh, Enkeleda Aliu in, um, in Geneva. She's from Kosovo. Uh, but there was one question from Bridget Bohm in, um, in the chat as well. And she asked something about direct selling. She said, do you still think that today that is mainly uh, for women? And, and maybe I want to uh, let you answer that question in the context of the evolution that Tupperware has undergone over the years. Because when I think of Tupperware, I think of Tupperware in the 1950s or 60s in America, when there were a lot of um, women in the US that were uh, staying at home, uh, not working outside of the home. But that shifted enormously as well, didn't it? And then your main markets became uh, other markets around the world. So could, could you comment just briefly on, um, on uh, the, the future of direct selling and, and, and uh, the situation of, of women in particular? Yeah. Well, I think, firstly, the channel of distribution will continue in the future. What's interesting, firstly, yes, it did move from after the post-Second World War to people were stay-at-home moms, mostly in the U.S., and, and you had a lot of that in Europe uh, as well. But in the emerging markets of the world, only 30% of the women ever really worked outside the home. Here's the shift that's happening. 58% of all millennials those born after 1990 don't want a traditional job. As a matter of fact, I had one of my daughters say to me not too long ago, Dad, I do not want to spend my life in a cubicle in some office. You're finding more and more, we're saying, how do I craft together work and, and, and a career where I maybe don't even have to be one place? It can be assembling these different things uh, that, that's the gig economy that's happening. What, what we do in direct selling is you really allow her a chance to, it's a very efficient way to sell a product because you're not paying the cost of, of advertising. 
millennials don't believe ads. Eighty percent of millennials don't believe advertising. You're not paying for rent uh, in it, so the value chain is thrown into these incredible kinds of of products. And then people really don't sell; they share because they usually are sharing it with a friend, neighbor, or relative. Now we're finding that particularly. Some people in the U.S. and Europe, they said, oh, yeah, but there's so much stores and Internet, et cetera. Hey, 1.1 billion people live in the U.S. and Europe. The U.S. and Europe are not the world. There are 7.5 billion people in the world, and 45% of them are living on $5.50 a day or less. This empowers her. Yeah. This feeds her family. This sends her kids to university, and we've seen that. Uh, that was our whole focus. The、That's、whole growth、uh, area. And that is Davos of, of empowerment of women. Yeah,、um, I, I actually want to. You touched on the point of emerging markets there. I want to come back to that in just a minute.、Uh, we also got a question from、uh, Philip in Russia、uh, about emerging markets. But before we do, I, I, I wanted to get to Enkeleda Aliu.、Uh, she's from Kosovo and is on the Geneva campus of EU Business School. Enkeleda. Hello.、Uh, so my question, hi. hi.、Uh, my question is regarding artificial intelligence, which is gaining a tremendous momentum worldwide.、Uh, and you, as a as a leader who is working in business for more than twenty years, what do you think、uh, about its effect in the business world? Well, you know, I, I, I I've been firstly,、uh, I finally learning how to pronounce your name. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> I was kidding, Peter. That you know, where are the Marys or the Johns? <laughs> Because we're from all over the world, and that's the richness of our languages and cultures. Artificial intelligence. It's interesting. I'm on the board of the Peter Drucker Forum that we meet every year in Vienna, and we're right now trying to decide are we going to have the November meeting. But we dealt with this two years ago fairly deeply. And the issue is, artificial intelligence is going to replace a lot of the, and I mean this respectfully, mindless jobs uh, uh, that are that are out there, and、uh, and so that a lot of the administrative positions are going to go away. That's okay because what really is going to be needed today are the kinds of roles and responsibilities. That require human judgment, and more and more. And this is one of the concerns I have about many graduate business school programs: is not is not enough attention is focused on the human dynamics of it, of of what humans add with with regard to it. And much has been written the last two years, particularly the companies that learn how to do this best. Are going to be the ones that really win in the future. There, you free your people to do the things only human intelligence and sense can really do. To see what isn't, so that you free them by redeploying the assets that you normally had to spend down here. So, I really see it as an opportunity here for the future, for making the world a better place, and for enriching individuals more. Yeah. Um, and it's it's、uh, you know there's so many changes coming at at, at us、uh, in the world. Of course, we have the crisis now. Then you have technology,、uh, and as you said, also a, a balance is shifting in terms of where the global economy is is、uh, the weight of the global economy is headed.、Um, I, I want to I promise to ask you that question about emerging markets, which which basically is、um, you know a lot of companies are now reassessing in light of the crisis whether they should stay. In、uh, their global markets, or they should retreat to their home markets.、Uh, I, and I add to that perhaps the, the color of、uh, Philip, who asks, you know, when he who lives in in Russia, and he says, you know, a lot of、uh, small and medium business、uh, companies are struggling in in Russia.、Uh, looks like they'll have to close shop very often.、Um, when when you look at that global lens of having led a global company,、uh, what would you recommend、uh, business leaders to do today if they have to decide? Whether to retreat from markets、uh, to their home market or to continue their operations, if that was part of their plan in the first place. 
I think it all goes back to the core values of what a company is. A, I've always had this, at least my adult leadership life, that all a company is, is a collection of people. And the company that can attract the best people, can empower them, develop them, and reward them, they're going to win in the future. Because that those people will shift the product line. They'll do whatever they need to do. So the recognition that that's what a company is, you don't abandon your people. I, I'll tell you, I've, uh, there's been so much pressure on me the last 20 years to abandon Venezuela, uh, particularly a, 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 after uh, you know, Maduro took over uh, uh, as head of the country. And we said, oh, it's too hard to make money, money there. I said, we have 20,000 people that work in Venezuela. She feeds her family uh, by this. She stopped what she was doing and invested in learning how to do this. Figure out how we can do business in Bolivars. Figure out how to make it work. We never had to, during my time, uh, abandon that. So we, uh, I think you stay committed to those markets. And I think it's short-term thinking to sit there and think, well, wait, we have a home market. That's what matters to us. If you're in a market, that's who you are. Now, you, may, you can find other ways of doing it. You can have an importer model in that. You can work clusters there. But Lord knows, don't leave. Uh, yeah. and I think you pay the price, particularly if you're a respected brand. Yeah, it, it, I think that's true. And, and you've shown that as well with the example that you gave of Venezuela. Um, we've got a few more questions, but before we turn to those from the chat, I want to get to Lebogang uh, Mogosi in uh, South Africa. He's in Johannesburg, and he's got a question for you, too. Uh, good day, Mr. Goings. Hi. Yes, thank you for sharing your time with us. Eh? The question I wanted to ask you is, what was the biggest challenge you faced as CEO and chairman of Tupperware Brands with your management team, and what helped you overcome it? Thank you. Firstly, I, I must say, by the way, South Africa is another example of there was great pressure on me during the and the company in the 90s to because of apartheid to abandon the business in South Africa, even though 93% uh, of our uh, people that worked at the Tupperware uh, facility outside of Joburg were black South Africans, we basically said we're not going to abandon them. We signed and were co-creators of what were called the Sullivan Principles, that how do we not abandon our people there, and yet how do we show non-support for apartheid? And it worked, and our people never forgot us that we were there uh, during that period of time. So you get a lot of challenges like that, and you have to decide what are the values? What's the long? Always play for the long game uh, here that match your values right up here. Probably the greatest challenge I, I've had uh, is I've got to say it's been the challenge on succession. Uh, uh, we we picked a successor. Uh, uh, it was a woman. Uh, we believed. Uh, she had 20 years experience, it would work out right. Uh, after about a year, it became clear that it wasn't working out. Uh, the, the, um, the passion and the purpose was being replaced by simple process. And so it was like a deflation uh, of the energy of, of the people. So you would think I'd pick a different example. So this is an example where it didn't work out right. Uh, I eventually resigned from the board. Uh, they've been through three successors since then. Uh, uh, you got to get this right. And I would have done it differently. And I learned from, from that. And I, so I put it in my, my moleskin playbook of what I'd done, would have done differently. Every other challenge that we've had in the past, we were able to overcome. This is one, it's still going to be written, and I'm not in control of it, because I feel an incredible responsibility for a company 
for the legacy of the women who were out there building a career. And we've got to find a way. I'm trying to influence that. Yeah. Wish I had better. I wish I had a better no, but story it's, of a good answer. It says a lot that uh, you know you choose to to take an example where you actually said it, this was in the end a failure. And and I think it's a testament to your belief that you learn through failure, but that you do fail uh, and that that happens. I want to ask you a last question before we close. Uh, it's a question that comes in, in uh, for example, from Stefano. He's asking, you know, if, uh, if you were to start a business now, uh, would you bet on e-commerce? And then some other people are asking, what do you think the future is of direct selling? And then a third person is asking, you know, should I go work for a big company or should I start my own company? Could you just tell us maybe a little bit to wrap up all those three questions into one answer? Um, what would Fabulous you do questions. today? Fabulous <laughs> questions, uh, 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 by the way. Firstly, with regard to, I think, channels of distribution, I think the story in the future is going to be not just one or the other. It's going to be an and. And you're going to find multi-channel strategies uh, out there uh, that will differentiate here. That's, I, I do think e-commerce is going to be a crowded space. I happen to believe that they're probably the federal government is going to is going to need to legislate with regard to antitrust for companies like Amazon, because what's happening is they're killing competition out there. And antitrust legislation in the 1900 was to encourage competition. They are a logistics company. Yeah. They make about as much now uh, uh, from the Amazon Prime as they do for the shipping cost that goes out and they're squeezing out everybody there. And, you know, the founder of, uh, oh God, the- uh, Jeff Bezos. Job, huh? Jeff Bezos. No, 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 not Bezos. <laughs> the guy, the animation company that did Pixar. Oh, sure, uh, Steve Jobs. Yeah, you know, get, you know, it wasn't Steve, the guy who really started it. Get, so we did a thing together at, uh, at, uh, uh, at at, at, at this last Vienna conference, and we believe that it's killing competition all over the world, but particularly. But, but as for yourself, because young people, of course, uh, they think about what should I do? Should they start a direct selling company? Should they start an e-commerce company, or should they just go and work for a big company? What would you do if you were twenty-two okay, years old? But that's you know what I'd learn the different channels of different. I mean, I happen to believe find out what you're what you're good at and find out what your bliss with regard to it. Direct selling is a wonderful way to do it if you love working with people. And if people ask me, what, is, what business have I been in? My whole life I've been in trying to become a better version of myself, but I happen to be in a business where that's what I'm doing with people. In this room, in the next room here, 24 at a time, we train leaders over these four day things about how to move from the person you are today to the person you could become. Now that last piece of, would I go with a big company? Pluses and minuses. I think if you were the big company, you have an opportunity to be in a room with people who have different skills and to learn with those skills. I happen, I happen to, just as I encourage one of my sons, Nico, don't start your own thing first because you're gonna be the smartest person in the room. Sure. Because you can't have the talent. What, what I really learned when I went to Avon, and it was a watershed moment, everybody in the room was smart. What differentiated me? I had general management skills, and I had courage. <laughs> I had run my own deal. I had, had to write the checks on Friday. They just didn't have the courage I did because, you know, he's doing audit. He's doing marketing. Yeah. So spend a little bit of time in a big company. And I still think the opportunity to be an entrepreneur is incredible. That's where most jobs will be in the future. Well, I think that's an excellent uh, way to end the, uh, the conversation, Rick. I, I've, and I've, we've talked a number of times, but I've really learned a lot, again, from talking to you. And I already want to thank you. But before um, we all thank you and, and give you a virtual applause, uh, I want to hand it back over to, uh, to look for some final thoughts. But thank you, Rick. Thank you very much, Mr. Goings. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, it has been a, a wonderful hour listening to you. 
uh, to all your insight. I'm sure everybody has enjoyed it. Um, there is definitely some, some great learnings to get out of it. So thank you. Um, yes. And, um, for our, the, the next stage for our students is May 12th um, for, the, for the continuation of our uh, Learning from Leaders uh, series with Mr. Beaver. Um, in the meantime, all stay safe and thank you for joining.